Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. everyone and welcome back to a fork in time podcast uh this is chris coppola co-host of the podcast and i'm joined today by uh the originator the founder of the entire thing don shelley hey chris you, you're you're in, you're in you're in the big chair today i i am i am um yeah I, it's we're, we're gonna talk about the lumbar support we got some work to do there but yeah yeah big chair i'm enjoying it um so this today we're going to do a topic that I had actually sent in earlier. I had sat down and written out a couple of different ideas for topic suggestions, and uh, I'd been mulling it over. And this one, um, the working title of it is World War, the Boar Detour. Um, that rhymes. It does. It does. And, and, you know, one of the things we've talked about is, is our reach globally and, and, you know, how we do have an international audience, uh, generally English speaking, but I do want to take this opportunity to apologize to those of you that are not native English speakers uh, on behalf of the entire English speaking world. If you write that out or if you're, you know, even just looking at this on uh whatever podcast aggregator you use or the website. If you look at that, it should not rhyme. And yet somehow it does. Don't ask me why, but I do want to apologize to anybody who's ever tried to learn English and pronounce it properly. I don't well, you know. know you, you know why that is, Chris, because the English language has stolen its vocabulary from almost every other language ever. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so really, it's it. Are, are we saying it's everyone else's fault for not getting on the same page? I, I, I would I, I would never go there. Would never go there because there's plenty there's plenty for us English speakers to be blamed for. I right. have no doubt. Right. So we had talked off podcast about this, and and this is a little bit of a uh, huh, to 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 the average American consumer of history. This is a little bit of a furry woodland creature, so I I did ask for a little bit of forbearance and and uh, when we get into the what did happen, this is this is going to be a bit of a deep track. We're, we're going to do a little bit more of the background just to help people understand what what we're talking about here. Which I, I'm all in favor of, and as we've talked about before, diversifying our geography and our both both our temporal and our geographic scope the diversification is one of the things we're shooting for here in 21. yeah so whew, we're gonna start with the dutch empire um 1600s you know way back beginning of the age of exploration the netherlands start sending out both explorers and settlers and uh, most of us are familiar with Manhattan was one of them. Um, they also settled uh, the Dutch East Indies, today's Indonesia. And other than that, one of the places they sent settlers was the Cape of Good Hope down in Southern Africa. Uh, eventually, those settlers kind of moved a little bit further inland uh, during the Napoleonic Wars when the Batavian Republic, which was the Netherlands at that point, um, well, pick the wrong side. The British used that opportunity to snap up some of the coastal regions in Southern Africa and push the Dutch settlers further inland. So that when we arrive very close to our point of departure in the later 19th century, you have two, I'm going to call them Dutch states, states of these boars which is the term for, uh, the Dutch term for farmer. They have been, you know, kind of moved into central, um, 
central South Africa, away from the coast, which is kind of what the British are mainly concerned with because, you know, India, ships, they like it. It, it, it you know, very it works for them. To, it, yeah. it works for them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we get to the point where gold is discovered in what is at that point some of these Boer republics. Um, and if there's one, you know, thinking about what's going on in the United States at this point, you don't want to have gold discovered on your land because that's going to mean other people will come and make it their land. And that is very much what happened. Um, in 1886, gold was first discovered in the these Boer republics. And by 1896, these republics accounted for fully one third of all of the gold produced in the world. And that's not to mention um, the importance of this area in diamond mining. Um, many of you out there have probably heard of De Beers. That's, this is where they came from. Uh, so the discovery of diamonds and gold in this area, I mean, you know, think, think, of, think of expensive things. And wow, all of a sudden they start coming out of this almost backwoods area. Um, I, I, I suddenly have this dancing image of either Marilyn Monroe and or Madonna acting like Marilyn Monroe talking about one of those two things being a girl's best friend and the other one certainly being something that ladies like. Yes, yes. And when you mix them together, I mean, yeah. Um, so, sure. Uh, what happened in 1896, this is kind of the beginning of our real departure. Um, the British unofficially, these were people who were British citizens, but were not officially acting under the orders of the British government, uh, launch what's called the Jameson Raid into these countries, into uh, the Orange Free State and Transvaal. These were, th those are the name of the two uh, Boer republics trying to basically go in and overthrow them to establish friendly governments. Um, I think it's pretty analogous to a little bit earlier in the United States, we had something called filibusters, which was not a speech on the... By the way, I don't know how these two things came to be called the same thing. I don't know how a filibuster went from kind of a piratish mercenary going into Latin America to try and establish a colony for the United States to somebody sitting on the Senate floor reading a phone book. I don't know how that happened. I'm interested in knowing why, though. But so kind of like, you know, the American filibusters in, in uh, Central America, this private group tried to overthrow the Boer governments. Um, they failed, failed miserably. Uh, one of the results of this, though, is, is a little guy who kind of got me started in this entire podcast, uh, Wilhelm II, going back to my first episode, um, is the Emperor of Germany. And at this point, one of the things he does, if you remember that episode, he... <sighs> I'd say he was a bull in a china shop, but that doesn't give the bull enough credit. Um, and, and what he's in is larger than a china shop in terms of uh, in terms of the impact that he's having too. So uh, absolutely, absolutely. And and one of the things he does is he, you know, this is kind of actually about the time that that last episode took place. He has come into power and he is making his mark in the world. And one of the things, one of the policy changes or, you know, the things that he brings about is imperial and uh, naval rebuilding, which puts him on a collision course with Great Britain. And eventually, you know, many people think leads to the systems of alliances that led to the First World War. Um, I myself 
in in discussing this with a friend of mine, talked about the Wilhelm the Second telegram, and and it quickly became clear that we didn't know which one I was talking about because there was the Zimmerman telegram, there was the Willie and Nikki telegram, there was this telegram, there were telegrams congratulating <laughs> Hitler on his conquest of France later I, I i i just am sitting there and and picturing you know in whatever lavatory establishment you had in the hollandsaren palace at three in the morning wilhelm the second sitting there with a telegraph machine typing out messages as, so you're as, so, so you're saying that, that 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 this was this was the early version of uh, of the twitterverse so to speak <laughs> I, I think these were some of the early 3 a.m tweets yes um it, especially in the sense of these are just statements put out there that don't really have a whole lot of forethought that don't really have they're not vetted they're not you know run up the right channels they're just kind of spewed out and they become policy or maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they're coming from a head of state. And so people think they are policies right? and they react to them as if they are policies. So Wilhelm the second sends out this tweet. Um, going forward a little bit, uh, three years later, the British, basically start sending tons and tons of troops right up to the border to take a vacation. They don't really say what they're doing down there. Uh, the Orange Free State and Transvaal, these Boer republics, look at this and say, okay, Britain, you can withdraw them or there's going to be a problem. Britain doesn't, and that's how we got the Boer War. Uh, the second the second Boer War, but if you ever hear somebody talk about the Boer, this is the one they're talking about. Right. Um, there was one earlier, kind of in the, you know, British expanding out from those coasts, taking over some land, but th the second one's the big one. Um, what happens here is, you know, the the constant story of, of, of the British Empire, either... India in the 1850s or, or whatever, any other colonial fight they get involved in, they lose quickly early. Um, when you have an empire like that, you don't have, you know, all of your strength where you need it when you need it. And several of their important cities, especially these gold mining areas, get taken over by the Boers. Uh, that's the first phase of the war. The second phase of the war is the Empire Strikes Back. Um, literally, the Empire Strikes Back. I, I really am picturing Redcoats on Hoth right now. <laughs> um, and the British, with all of their empire, including Australia, New Zealand, India as well, Canada, come into South Africa, push out the Boers, take over these states, these countries they formed, and the Boers don't surrender. They go to the hills. They're farmers with... Some people would portray them as farmers with squirrel guns. Um, it actually turns out that they have gotten a lot of Mauser rifles from where again? Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, G G Germany. Yes. Um, the Mauser of Germany is the best rifle in the world at this point, And Germany sells them to these boars. They buy them with, you know, this gold they have, um, to the extent that literally during the fighting, the British s come forward, they set up their artillery, they start bombarding the Boer positions and didn't even realize, hey, their guns can hit us. You normally don't set up big artillery where like the regular rifles can hit you. You, you kind of want to be a little bit further back from that. British had no idea. Um, 
In fact, this was when they stopped wearing red coats because they realized not even on Hoth, in general, a red coat makes you very easy to see. So, you know, this back and forth, they they fight a guerrilla war against these South African um, rebels, these commandos. It's actually where the term commando comes from. And eventually they sign a peace treaty. Uh, two years, three years of war later, they sign a peace treaty uh, and what is called the Union of South Africa, which is these two four republics, Transvaal and the Orange Free State, are merged with the British colonies of Natal and the Cape in 1910 to form the Union of South Africa. And the Union of South Africa is under the control, is it, their elected prime minister is Luis Botha, who was actually the leader, one of the major leaders of the Boers. So there's a lot of Boers in leadership of the Union of South Africa. Okay. I think that's a good setup. All right. So that sets the stage. And uh, so when we, when we come back after the break here, what we're going to do is pick up on... Uh, Chris done a great job of setting the historical what did of uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, southern, southern, southern part of Africa. So we're going to pick up with the what if. And so teasing the what if when we come back, the what if is going to be what, Chris? The what if is going to be this. Getting back to the, you know, 3 a.m. telegrams that aren't thought through. What if they were thought through? What if this was part of a concerted policy by Imperial Germany to recognize the Union of South Africa as a weakness in the British Empire. And we will then explore how that might have ricocheted throughout history. So we hope you join us when we come back here on A Fork in Time. See you in a minute. Taking just a quick break from the podcast here, it's Dodd. Alexis. And we're talking to you today about something that we both use and we both enjoy. And that is going to be what, Lex? That's going to be Audible. Audible. I've been using Audible. I was actually trying to think of this the other day, Lex. I think I've actually been been using Audible now for almost 20 years. Uh, wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> uh, says something about my age, but also says something about how Audible has had sticking power. Because what Audible does is they are, I think, the leading provider of audio uh, of all types of genres and all types of means uh, on, on any device you want to listen to that audio on. So typically I think of that as being an audio book. book. Uh, but that's not the only thing, right, Lex? Oh, no. They have podcasts. They have theatrical productions. Audible has tons, thousands of things you could listen to. Yeah, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions. And so we are both Audible users. Uh, it, in fact, it, I, I jokingly tell folks that I work with and that I talk to in my, in my, in my other life, my real life, <laughs> Uh, all the time that I'm pretty much now about the only way that I read is to be read to Two. no strain on the eyes. And I can do that very easily with audible. So we have a special offer for a fork in time listeners. You can follow the link in the show notes or go to audibletrial.com slash a fork in time. And you'll be able to take advantage of a free month, one free month. And what comes with that free month, Lex? A free audio download. Yeah. Free audio download. It's easy to say audio book. And you may, I almost did. <laughs> and you may choose an audio book, but it could also be, as, as Alexa said, there's all types of audio that can be found there. This is unabridged audio. It's a wide variety of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, they're associated with Amazon, which means one of the things that happens if you uh, take advantage of the free offer and you happen to be a Prime member, you get not one, but two credits. Two credits towards Audible. Uh, programs for that first month. Of course, there is a cost after the first, first month free trial, but it enables you to try the service to see if it's something that you'll like. You keep those titles forever. By the way, they allow you to return titles that you don't like or don't listen to. I have found them to be both on a customer service aspect as well as just a, a service to use aspect, uh, one of my favorite things. Alexis and I both at various points in our professional lives have traveled a lot. Yeah. And uh, what you sometimes think of Audible as the road trip companion, right? Yeah. Before before I left on a trip, make sure you have an audiobook. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing there is you can do bookmarks, you can put notes, all the things you would want to do. 
So if you've been thinking about you know, getting into audiobooks or audio, or audio materials of any type, uh, we would certainly recommend Audible. And again, if you follow the links in the show notes or go as we described there to audibletrial.com slash a fork in time, uh, we get the credit for sending you there. You, you, get the, you get the good stuff that Audible is, so we certainly would appreciate it. Hi, welcome back. This is Chris Coppola from a Fork in Time podcast. And I'm joined today by Don Shelley, and we're discussing German imperial ambitions in Southern Africa, I guess. Uh, that, that's fair enough, and, uh, and, and how that interacts with uh, the big world stage. So uh, in interestingly enough, because we don't like to keep our readers, our listeners, our readers, if we had them in suspense either, uh, during the break, uh, Chris had raised the question of where filibuster came from and how a parliamentary procedure and, um, and the act of someone trying to, uh, I don't even know what to describe what a filibuster did otherwise, actually trying to create territory, so to speak. They both come from the French or Dutch, I'm sorry, the Dutch word, which means freebooter. And so essentially, a fil someone who's engaged in the filibuster activity like uh, we talked about in terms of, you know, going off and trying to take land or do that type of thing is essentially a pirate. And so the way that that got connected over to the parliamentary term is someone engaging in a filibuster in a legislative body is trying to essentially pirate control of the body by maintaining the filibuster. So... Okay. One, one's a pirate in a suit and the other one is a pirate in the real world. So there you go. There's your, uh, there's your etymology hit for the day here from a fork in time. And, and also uh, getting back to what you were previously saying for that, for that confusion about the two uses of filibusters, blame the Dutch, I guess. <laughs> so there we go. That connects us back yeah. in. Yes. So, 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 so before we were talking about setting up the historical what did of late 19th century and early 20th century, the southern part of Africa, uh, the situation here where what we get to is the formation of what will ultimately become what we call South Africa, the Union of South Africa. So specifically, Chris, tell us what the what if departure here, because it centers around one of what we talked about before the break, many telegrams that have flown around in history. So it's. And, and we did explicitly talk about what's called the Kruger telegram, which was Germany sending congratulations to the Boers in South Africa after defeating the British in this raid, uh, the Jameson raid, and not following up. It, it kind of like, okay, let's go ahead and pick a fight with the largest, the biggest empire in the world. And just just do it just to mess with them. Just do it to make them angry and not not do anything to actually weaken them to actually follow up on it at all. Um, and the the uh, point of departure is the Germans being a little more devious. Um, looking at Germany in World War One, they did on multiple occasions, try and take advantage of divisions within the Entente, the Allied powers. One of these examples is the CO train, where if, if you've ever read Churchill on it, it, it really sounds like Lenin was kind of like a virus that they threw into Russia and kind of, you know, saw what happened kind of create their own political pandemic in a way. Um, but also Germany was, you know, sending U-boats to arm the IRA in Ireland when that was still part of Great Britain. So Germany was, was using some of what it had to open up some of these fissures in their enemies during World War One, And the one they 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 didn't try and and the one that i think would have been really critical is trying to have kept open and built some of these relationships with the boers in south africa um germany actually does control what is today namibia uh which was at that point german southwest africa it's it's a sandbox in southern africa if if you you know 
know much about the German Empire. They they got scraps. Just so happens this scrap is right next door to South Africa. Right. So they did control, you know, land very close to South Africa. And um in our timeline, in our real history, uh there were smaller revolts by some of these Boers when the war starts and the British declare war on Germany, there were several of there were several groups, several bands, several what they were called commandos that openly revolted against the British, the Union government working with the British. And there were others who, upon hearing that war had been declared, um, would send telegrams to the capital saying, all right, we're armed, we're ready. Now, who do we fight? We, we, want, to, we want to fight somebody. We just don't know who yet. Um, right. Tell us. So in this scenario, the Germans develop these relationships, supply these groups. And when war is declared, the Union of South Africa falls apart. And these Boer groups start fighting again against the British Empire. Um, just to kind of bring it back to something that people might be a little more familiar with. Um, Downton Abbey. I know. You never thought I'd be the one bringing up Downton Abbey, right? I, I kind of... I, I'm not the English one, but if you remember, um, Grantham and uh, Bates served together in South Africa. Right. And now they're a little bit older during World War I. These were the same people. These names are the exact same people. Churchill was in South Africa. Uh, Botha, as I mentioned, the leader of South Africa, is today is at this point the prime minister. Jan Smuts, the person who's going to take over after Botha had and go on to an illustrious career in World War II, was another of these boars. So this is not quite 20 years in the past. And uh, it, it's, it's remarkable that this entire country that had risen against the British in the course of those 20 years is so on their side again. And in our fort, they're not. And, and haven't been for a while then before right. the, uh, before the war. So this is, this is, this is a conflict. This is a simmering in our fork here. This is a simmering event uh, that the, um, I tend to think of this as also being sort of not not the last stages of the British Empire, but we're moving into the latter stages of the British Empire as we start getting into the the twentieth century world wars, uh, the period between the wars, and certainly the period after the wars. Uh, but this is as they're starting. It, it, it's tougher to it's tougher to be Britannia ruling the seas and ruling everywhere and having possessions everywhere is putting a lot more strain. Uh, more strain than gain. I heard a professor use that term mm. once, so I'll use it that way. It's putting more strain than gain in terms of being an empire at that point. Yes, I think so. I, I think it, it, the interesting thing, if you read much about the history of the war, at one battle you had Botha, who's going to go on to lead the country, Churchill, who I mentioned earlier, and Gandhi as a stretcher bearer, all within maybe a two-mile square area of this, this one battlefield. It's kind. It's it's kind of a Forrest Gumpy like. Let's throw random people together. Let's have everybody come up and make an appearance in this story. Right. So if you have either the conflict going on, or I guess the other way to express this is essentially what comes to be German control mm -hmm. of that part of South Africa. Uh, why is that a big deal? Why does that matter in history, Chris? I mean, what what does that really do? How does that change something? So I don't think even it's German control. I think it's German threats. Um, you're right. Britain may not rule the ways for much longer, but they still do. And if you look at Germany's empire, um, it doesn't make it to 1915 to a large extent. There, there's some areas, but it doesn't really fare very well because they can't communicate back with Germany. The thing about South Africa is these are guerrillas. They are farmers. They don't really need 
a whole lot of supply to raise a whole lot of trouble. And the reason this is important, where they are is twofold. One, um, during World War I, the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, is on Suez. The Suez Canal is the border between British Egypt and um, the Ottoman Empire. So you can't run ships through it for a l probably into 1917. So for three years, you can't use the Suez Canal to get from Great Britain to almost the majority of their empire is kind of what they call east of Suez. So the first thing is the Cape of Good Hope, Southern Africa, this stopping off point is very important for the British to be able to access the manpower of their empire. If, if they can't, if, they, if that's threatened, to some extent, they have this wonderful, you know, all of these people, they can't get them where they need them. So I think one of the things you would see is instead of a Gallipoli campaign or instead of being able to use the Indian army on the um, Western, on the uh, Western front, like they were able to in 1915, I don't, I think the British have trouble accessing that manpower. And one of the things that that manpower leads to is um, I think instead of bringing it to Europe or bringing it to fight somewhere else, they've got to go try and fight boars with it. They've got to go try and, and settle down South Africa with it. Instead of, you know, if you if you read about the British and any of the empires during World War One, they need fresh bodies. And if you've got a front somewhere that is not, you know, northern France, to a large extent, the British view it as a sideshow. Or, or something that needs to, just, you know, they want it finished up. They want it. It's not the core of what they're doing. And in this case, South Africa, it would be a major man. It would be a major drain on resources. And um, you'd have to do it to get those resources to Europe. So, so you have a logistical problem that's obviously raised there by not having the access to the Suez. So you have to go around Africa. I guess there is this newly opened canal that lets you go all the way in the other direction, but that sure is a long way to go to cross the Atlantic, to cross the Pacific to get to where you want to get uh, yeah. by choosing to go through the, Pan the Panama Canal, which has just opened up about right before the start of, um, of, of the First World War. So one of it's logistic, but the other part is also economic because we talked about there's diamonds and there's gold and there's, there's wealth there in the Southern part of Africa. Yeah. So if you don't have either, if you have disruptions to those supplies or disruptions to being able to capitalize on those resources, we were talking about this off podcast, uh, the expectation from, uh, from the, um, from, from British authorities during the First World War with, was that the war was going to last a year, but that was not a military assessment. Right. Th this was, it will be in Berlin by Christmas. I mean, people were saying that, but, but the second in command of Great Britain, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the person responsible for their governmental finances said, don't worry, the war can't last more than a year because we can't pay for it after that point. Right. Um, and, and you mentioned, uh, you know, that at a certain point, it becomes a bit of a burden for the empire. The empire becomes a bit of a burden for Great Britain. Uh, to a large extent, it is World War I, which really takes the power away from the city of London. Um, and I don't mean the mayor. The city of London is kind of the financial... It's, it's how you say Wall Street in, in proper British, I guess is the best way of saying it. Um, right. it. It's the financial center of this massive empire. And even in our timeline, the economic strain, the financial strain of, I mean, just think about this, right? They have millions of young men who they're paying for. They are now employees of the government. That's not to mention the other economic disruption in terms of 
buying guns and buying ammunition and buying ships and buying all of these things that the government normally doesn't really buy a whole lot of just that amount of economic outlay mortally damaged the British pound without the gold species of South Africa and keep in, you know keep in mind the, the the biggest thing about these areas that had these reserves are this is where those boars lived. These are the areas that are going to be taken over. Without that species to back the pound, I the, the, the British Empire is in even worse circumstance than they wind up being after the end of the war. So do you think, Chris, there's a, a viable scenario, again, we're taking it back to the, I guess it was the Telegram 1896 that you're talking yeah. about here, that sort of, you know, it, it's not just words, it's not just words transmitted on a piece of paper, it translates into actions that follow it up. That really is what our yeah. point of departure is here, is it, it, it's sort of more than just, you know, nice, nice going guys, good job. Mm -hmm. um, it, it becomes a little bit more than that, but are, are you suggesting that one of the, the potential viable outcomes here is that you literally have because of what's changed in, in this part of their possession what's changed in the southern part of africa that you have a that you have a great britain that has to either enter into a peace because they can't afford the war to continue or they bankrupt themselves in, in winning the war in such a different way that world war one has a different outcome or that even if it has the same outcome the impact of achieving that outcome has changed things such that it it sets up what happens afterwards. Is it is it one or both? I I think um, I think this could really change how Britain fights the war. Um, as I mentioned, they you know the manpower issue and the finances. The one thing I point out is that's what America brings to the war. The United States brings. The financial, you know, we are the world banker, and this is where it changes. We are the ones that buy that British debt, and that neutral p transfer of power, and then eventually the American involvement is is why the Allies win. So I think Britain gets in a circumstance similar to where Churchill was in 1940, where they full on realize we need to get the Americans involved, not in a, well, it would be nice if we, no, we need, we lose if we don't get them and get them here now. Um, so under that scenario, the first thing that pops into my head is, you know, we, I think we've talked about this on a different, a different episode with a different you know, point of departure is this idea. It takes a while for America to decide that it wants to actually get actively engaged in this war. Yes. They're, you know, they're there, as you mentioned, they're, they're, they're supporting it economically by buying the British debt. But in terms of the actual, you know, sending troops, American soldiers, you know, cross, crossing the Atlantic and coming there. The first place that I go is that that probably happens sooner, right? Because it has to. You have to somehow find a way, uh, I, by hook or by crook, to get the Americans involved before, what, 1917, I guess, is the arrival of the American ex Expeditionary Force. In, call it 19. I mean, a, as we did talk about, call it 1918. 1918 yeah. is when we actually can do anything about it. Um, I, I feel like there's, there's, yes, yes, the United States does have to get involved sooner. Part of me, you know, one of the arguments you hear in looking at why the United States got involved in World War One isn't the you know isn't the actual proximate cause the assumption the resumption of unconditional of uh, unrestricted submarine warfare. It was a realization in certain power circles that if the Allies lose, we're going to lose all of our money, all of these. <laughs> things we bought and we got to back our bucks with some bullets or we're going to have a problem here yes yes and um i don't know if i completely subscribe to that argument but there certainly would have been more push among american financial circles and among american industrial circles to get involved so that we didn't lose those investments so i think the united states might have gotten involved sooner and just because we had to so ch chasing that little let string away, because I know that that's intrigued me, uh, is early American involvement 
does what again assuming an allied victory of world war one which i think it's still a fair thing to assume because there was a lot of things that were stacked against um it not they're not turning out that way but assuming that it gets that way because there's american involvement earlier there's more american involvement i mean does that do anything different for the assuming the same outcome uh, assuming the same reparations and other you know other things are imposed upon germany but does that change anything about how america stands post world war 1 that would have done something different in the what we think of as the interwar years or even as you've heard me you know I listen to this podcast for a period of time knows that i think of world war 1 and world war 2 being um, you know two acts of the same play with an intermission sort of in the middle kind of thing uh, does does it change anything about that i think it does I think it changes what Wilson is able to do as a statesman at Versailles? He came into Versailles with his ideas, and as lofty and as academic as they were, he could you know try and try and enforce those. Um, I feel like if the United States has comparable casualty list to Europe if the American public has sustained a war effort and has made the sacrifices that you know France France certainly did and Great Britain did um, I don't think Wilson's high talk satisfies Americans in that way at that point I, I, I think they're a little more involved in Europe. They're, they've paid more, so they want more, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. And so then the flip side of that is, is it realistic to believe at all if there's a change to the what if that we're suggesting, if there's a change to you know what's going on in the southern part of Africa, is there a chance that Germany is able to at least earn a draw for lack of a better way to think about it in my head or to earn by earning a draw essentially earning a victory so that there's we get to 1920 and 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 the setup on the world stage looks different than it does in the original timeline absolutely it absolutely does and here's how um two things first if you look at what happened in turkey in the ottoman empire they are russian troops between Gallipoli and the British invasion in Mesopotamia and down to Suez and up into the uh, Caucasus for the Battle of Sarakamish. And basically all of this running around, they're able to do it because Britain doesn't coordinatedly attack them at once. They can move back and forth. And if they don't have British Britain attacking them at all, because remember, the Anzacs and the Indian Army are who's doing that fighting in Mesopotamia and in Gallipoli. And if those troops are sent down to protect the gold mines and the shipping routes of South Africa, then you've got Turkey able to focus solely on what, what they want to do, which is either A, fighting the Russians, or B, coming into Egypt. Either one of those can cause a lot of problems for the Allies. I mean, if you look at when the United States got in, it's really interesting to think about, you know what? Yeah, unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, Russia just dropped out. You got a couple million German troops that just got freed up a couple of weeks before the U.S. declares war. So if the Turks are in the Caucasus raising trouble, I could see Russia having problems even sooner getting out even sooner so that even further exasperates the um, allied situation in Europe. So, no, I, 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 the one thing about this, I'm not sure that the, because we are talking about if the United States gets involved, I think it might have, but if they get involved, it's not one of those, just looking at the numbers, this was suicidal. Yeah, they actually did take out Russia. And if you got the empire, so, you know, busy somewhere else, man, you know what? Germany looks a lot better in Europe now. Right. 
So does that prevent World War II as we know it? Um, it's certainly a very different World War II. If it, I, I, I have never yet said no. I have never yet said that you know, it doesn't Because you know I keep asking you this question, Chris. It seems like on every episode we get to this eventually, for good reason, because we're following down the path there. But And, right, and I do feel like, by the way, at one point in the future, I'm going to sit down and kind of – Kind map out the what up. if that will map out the what if that will get you to a yes there. Yes, yes, absolutely, and and it will be Rube Goldberg, and it will involve somehow Kaiser Wilhelm and the Russo-Japanese War. I promise you that. I'll see if I can work in some Downton Abbey references. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a fun one when that happens. Um, but until then, <laughs> yeah. um, I it, you know. I don't just just because okay Russia let's assume Russia turns Soviet we're not going down that road we have other times to do it um France Brit you still have these empires and what they do not have is this existential fear that you know we we've ta- we've never done one on the Cuban Missile Crisis but we talk about it enough in that. At that point, both sides knew pushing the button would end their civilization. And right. in September of 1939, as as driving as preventing war was to Chamberlain and, and the West in general, as much as they wanted to avoid a replay of the First World War, they did it. And they went ahead and did it. And, and and I don't see anything changing that calculus. And and again, you know, the sides look different, maybe. Who's in charge of this country or that country looks different. Which side each country is on could look different. But y- you had these empires, you had these grievances, you had these competitions, and I just don't know if anything can prevent that other than driving home the point to every single world leader that one wrong decision could be the end of everything right and and that's that's why you ultimately end up with the cold war concept in the sense of we can't afford the, the 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 war that we're talking about there is hot in fact it's nuclear hot which is why we which is why we can't go there and so that's you know that's what changes to me that's the biggest thing of the 20th century and how warfare changes over the 20th century a lot of things happen there obviously from a technology standpoint you know looking at where things are um well recent episode we talked about you know the spanish american war which is really about that time frame right around the turn of a century obviously through uh, looking at the events of, you know, let's say the uh, the Gulf War <laughs> being yeah. towards the end of that in terms of just how much technology has progressed when you really think that through, it's like a, a wow kind of, you know, thought what happens yeah. in less than a century there. But the biggest thing that's changed, which is why those regional conflicts are what they are and what they're not is because of the specter, as you say, of we can't go all out here because all out is something that we can't go to yeah. uh, without, without tremendous risk. And so I think you're right. I, I agree with you there in the sense of, there still was enough of an impetus by whoever the powers are, however they are aligned and for whatever motivations or reasons, you know, whatever becomes the equivalent of a, the assassination of an archduke in any scenario, you know, that becomes the grievance under which something happens, they're still likely to happen because the underlying undercurrents of what's what's there. I, I don't know if we never even talked about this off podcast. I, I know that but you're a science fiction fan as well. I'm really excited here in 2021 about the upcoming adaptation of Asimov's Foundation. Uh, if you're familiar with those novels, you know, this idea of psycho history, you know, can hit this history follow patterns or predictions. We've talked about, you know, the, the big man of history theory versus the force of nature. I mean, the force of history type of thing, but I tend to fall more on the side of, you know, the forces are there exactly how they get triggered or how they, they, they launch off or how they manifest themselves is not going to change just because the underlying conflicts exist. Right. Right. And you can't get away from them. So is, is there anything big we've missed here on this, uh, on this what if so there's just some and this is this is very tangential but but something that kind of informed my thinking about this um down this road if 
let's say we do have a little bit of a, you know, rosy ish scenario that Britain is damaged, the United States gets in sooner, and we have a relatively similar outcome in Europe to what we had in our timeline. Here's the one interesting thing about getting back to the Union of South Africa. Um, one of the big things that the British were able to do in the Union is to co-opt the Boers. To basically let them run the country the way they wanted to, and, and it was, you know, okay, and you'll be part of the Commonwealth. Um, in this timeline, in this scenario, if the Boers have caused the British trouble twice, I don't think they take as much of a hands-off approach to South Africa. And one of the outcomes of that is this. I feel like um, the after World War II and the role that South Africa played standing by Great Britain, um, the Boers were one of the driving forces there in instituting apartheid. And I feel like the British, looking at this situation, would say, you know what? We have these groups here in South Africa that were loyal to us. We have this other group that wasn't. Who are we going to support in the restructuring of this colony? Who are we going to involve? And, and so I think it's an interesting possibility that the Boers are on the outs, and you don't have the apartheid system the way you did in our South Africa. Hmm. <laughs> Which has interesting, interesting late 20th, it had ramifications across the entire 20th century, but certainly into the latter part of the 20th century as well. Exactly. Uh, well, and I'm even thinking there a little bit about how Gandhi... Gandhi in, in India plays to, you know, things that happened in South Africa as well. There's a connection there. I remember from you know, the, the movie back in the, it's been a long, I need, I need to watch that movie again. It's been a while mm -hmm. since I've seen that. Uh, but just, you know, remembering all the connections that exist there as well. Yes. Yeah. So. so what we've managed to do today, as we always do, Chris, is we've managed to potentially change the outcome of a major world war and mm -hmm. restructure the map of the world pretty substantially all just in about 35 minutes of talking and financial system don't forget the world financial system just yeah, completely yeah. revamped it because that's that's how we roll here on a fork in time yeah yeah and we've also uh, done the extra benefit today of letting folks know the source of filibuster both versions of the of the definition and again like you said we have the dutch to blame for that so um and for really this entire episode i mean keep in mind the boars were originally dutch so there you go yeah there you go and 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 everything's everything everything Every comes back <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all on the wheel it all comes around before it's all said and done all right you got anything else chris before we close this one out uh not really i just want to take a chance to thank everyone for listening to the podcast and encourage you to send in your ideas if you have a way to stop world war ii let us know or <laughs> you know i'll try and incorporate it into my grandmaster plan of how to finally answer yes to that question uh, and maybe I'll just stop asking that question. It's always seen, it, it seems that again, it, partly because of the topical times that we often talk about, we always come across that you know that particular point in history. And it's again, it's always a I've learned more about the connection between the world wars in the 20th century in the last five to ten years than I ever fully realized in my previous study of history. Just how I, mean, I knew that there was obviously the connection that existed, but just really understanding you know how those two things are so interconnected and how they tie back to things that have been going on for so long that it's, uh, you know, it, it don't, I don't want to say that anything's ever inevitable, but boy, it sure does feel inevitable in so many ways that, you know, eventually this had to happen in some way, shape, form or fashion. Yeah. Well, again, we're, we're still excited about having Chris being a bigger part of the show. This was his first, this was his, he, he was, he was in the driver's seat today. So I'm happy to have that. And as Chris suggested, we certainly do love the ideas we were looking through before we began recording today. Some of the, 
sort of the backlog we have now of ideas. It's good to have a backlog there. Uh, just a matter of getting episodes produced and you know, carving out the time to get them recorded. And, and and I'm interested to see what's going on there. So we encourage our listeners to go to www.aforkintimepodcast.com and to take advantage of the feedback mechanisms that exist there. And um, and if you can figure out a magical way to get Chris to answer yes there, uh, there may even be like a fork in time mug for somebody for that. Now that I think about it, I'd be willing to pay for that. So uh, good deal. Chris, if you don't have anything else, I'm going to go ahead and uh, shut us out here and close us out here by following along with what Alexis would require that I do if she were on the episode today, which is suggest to our listeners that if they happen upon a fork in time, what do we think they ought to do? Uh, follow it. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.